Welcome to the Booktopia podcast. I'm Ben Hunter, Booktopia's Fiction Category Manager. And wherever you're listening, I hope you're safe and you're smiling. I'm recording this on Zoom today from my home on the banks of Guliari. I pay respects to traditional owners um, and elders past and present. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. When literary, I'm going to say this again. When literature is alive, it hums and rattles and warms and hurts and heals. Hannah Bent and her wondrous Harper and Marlowe have changed the way I've been going about my days. What a gift. Those are the words of Trent Dalton, the creator of Voice Weather's Universe, on the new novel, When Things Are Alive, They Hum. It's the debut novel of my guest today, Hannah Bent. And that's Hannah Bent with a B, uh, not the author of Burial Rights. This is a debut novel. Uh, Hannah has created this wonder as a love letter to family and the hum that connects us all. It tells the story of these two sisters, Marlo and Harper. Harper has Down syndrome and a congenital heart condition. And when Marlo returns home from study abroad, she finds her sister in need of a heart transplant. The medical establishment denies Harper this because of her disability. Yes, this is a book that will make you cry. And here to talk to me about it is Hannah. Hannah, thanks for being here. Thanks so much for having me, Ben, and for the very generous introduction. Oh, don't thank me. Thank Trent Dalton. That's amazing. <laughs> Before we rip into the book, uh, how are you? Uh, are you coping okay? What have you been doing to get through lockdown? Um, I'm, I'm good. I have a 11 month old baby. So I, um, I'm, she's just started walking. So I'm literally just chasing her around the place constantly. <laughs> um, she keeps me on my toes and, um, when I can, I read a little bit and write a little bit, but, um, yeah, lockdown has been, um, I, I feel like, um, I've become an 11 month old baby by being trapped inside the house. I can only imagine what it would do to an actual 11 month year old baby. Maybe, maybe, maybe the baby, it's just normal to them. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Maybe well, she's got a lot of eyes on her and a lot of attention. So she's enjoying it. I think it's what more could you want? Yeah. Um, so this is a novel informed by life and by family. Mm-hmm. So, um, why don't you tell me about yourself? Uh, uh, when did you grow up? What were your family like? Um, so I, I grew up in Hong Kong. My um, dad was a pilot and my mum was a midwife. Um, and uh, I have a sister, Camilla, who lives with Down syndrome. Um, so we, we had quite a, um, I'd say, enchanting childhood, really. Um, growing up in Hong Kong and um, um, we did a lot together. And how old were you when you realised that your sister was really different or that she would have a very different life to the life that you would have? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I, would, I was very aware of the way that people would treat her differently to the way that they would treat me. Um, but I never quite understood it because in my eyes, um, I didn't, I mean, I knew she had difficulty doing things like tying her shoelaces and sometimes saying complex words. But to me, she, I didn't really see the disability um, as a defining factor of uh, who she was. Um, So, I mean, as a child, I I, I knew that there was, she had this label that that people considered her different, but... um, I still think to this day, I'm not sure um, that I feel that she is different in the the same way that others have perceived her, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm sure that would be true. Uh, It's it's very much um, a personal experience. Mm. And um, yeah, we're we're way too quick to put labels on people and to put them into buckets. Um, Harper in your novel is is such a incredible character. Um, she refers to this disability, as we call it, as up syndrome rather than down syndrome, uh, and she sees it as a kind of a gift or, or a talent for um, limitless love and wonder. Yeah. Uh, is is that 
talent you get to, is that something that you get to share in as the sibling, um, as, as from that kind of privileged position of, of being so close to the person? Do you get to share in a bit of that wonder? And, and if so, what, what are the rest of us missing out on? <laughs> um, growing up, it was quite contagious, really. Uh, my sister was um, vivacious, full of life, charming, humorous, a wonderful performer. Um, she did not care what people thought about her. She would break out into song in the middle of a crowd. Um, you know, and um, being the sister of someone who lived like that was um, a real privilege in a way and, and quite enchanting. Um, my sister also um, had this kind of otherworldly quality to her where um, I remember specific incidences where she would kind of take hold of a, a friend's hand or a family member's hand when they were silently um, suffering over something and hadn't really spoken about it and, you know, kind of render them in tears because she, they, she had made them feel less alone, I suppose, in a way, or she, she somehow picked up on what they were feeling. Um, there's so many incidences of my sister doing things that um, I couldn't quite explain. And I guess that was one of the inspirations for writing the novel, not to try and um, pin down this quality or, or um, define it, but perhaps to um, give it words um, yeah. and materialize it somehow in, in a way that um, other people can share in it. And you've, it's an older sister, right? So, so you've, you've grown up with this person as a presence your, your whole life. Yeah. Um, how, how is, I mean, I guess this is a really hard question to answer, but how, how does that evolve your, your way of seeing the world? Because older siblings are, are, are the model for us, how we conduct ourselves. Um, how, how do you see things differently to others? Do you think? <laughs> um, I'm not sure if I see things differently to others, but I feel I'm a little more um, kind of present to smaller things, perhaps. I mean, this sounds a little cliche, but just, you know, going for a walk this morning and seeing the skin of an old gum tree. I mean, just for me, that was just so beautiful. And, um, you know, my sister would marvel at things like that and would bring my attention to things like that. And so I guess in a way she's trained me to look out for these things and find beauty in them. Um, yeah, I think it's quite special. Mindfulness before it was cool. Yeah, <laughs> very much so. Um, tell me about Hong Kong. Um, what was it like there when you were a child? And um, when was the last time you went back? Um, so it is, I, I love Hong Kong. It is a city um, full of vibrancy and energy. It's, it's um, there's always something happening. You can go get like whatever cuisine you want in the early hours of the morning. Um, it, it really is a melting pot of different cultures. Um, it's obviously changing a lot uh, in the past few years, but it still um, has a very special place in my heart. So um, I, I guess it was a big, it played a big role in the novel for me as well. And I, I had a real homesickness for it while I was writing. I, I wrote most of the novel um, while living in Australia and um, it was really nice to write it because I felt like I was going back there in my mind. <laughs> how, how much of your life have you been there? Um, pretty much a huge chunk of my life. So I was born there and I grew up there. I left when I was uh, 18 to study in London mm. and came to Australia when I was around 24. So um, a long time. And um, my husband and I are um, currently living there now as well. So we moved back. So you, do you feel like you're writing, writing that city from an, from an insider's perspective then? Because um, it's, 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 it's such a place, it's, it's, it's this kind of crucial part of the world right now in terms of politics and 
and media. Um, uh, it it must be interesting to to see it through the eyes of someone who's who's been there for so long. Yeah, I mean, um, it's an interesting question. I'm obviously not Chinese, and um, you know, I uh, that's an experience that I won't have. Um, mm. I have. I have spent the majority of my life there and um, I feel it's kind of part, a huge part of my cultural identity, um, a huge part of my childhood and my young adult life um, and plays a huge part in the way that I see the world. So um, in that respect, yeah, it's, it's uh, very much a big part of who I am. Uh, how do Hong Kongers approach Down syndrome? Uh, and is it um, different to uh, cities in the West? That is a very interesting question. Um, growing up, I felt, I mean, one comment I would hear a lot was, oh, she's done something terrible in a past life. Um, that's why she's Down syndrome. She's paying off her karma. Um, and there, there was a lot of stigma. I mean, a lot of um, individuals who live with a disability are often kept, well, they were often kept locked away. You'd never really see anyone with a disability. Um, or you'd rarely see someone with a disability um, walking around the city. Um, and then when you would, everyone stares. So um, it, that was a real difficulty, I felt, growing up. Um, I mean, there's a scene in the novel where um, Lewis is on the bus and he gets up and someone wipes the seat after he's stood up. I mean, that really happened to my sister. And um, just things like that uh, were very difficult growing up. Um, having said that, I think Hong Kong is changing and it's, um, it's definitely much more inclusive than it was. Um, I mean, when I first moved to Australia, it was, it was wonderful to see adults who live with Down syndrome working in a restaurant, for example, or a library and, and um, you know, being acknowledged for their ability rather than their disability. I mean, I was very inspired by that. And luckily, Hong Kong is kind of um, much more on that wavelength now. So things have changed. In, in this novel, Harper needs a heart transplant. Yeah. And um, because of her disability, like really specifically, um, the surgeons uh, don't want to elect her for that surgery. Yeah. Um, of a woman in the US who has Down, who lives with Down syndrome and um, she had a successful heart transplant. Um, her name is Charlotte Woodward. And she, um, along with other um, organizations are advocating for a change in um, legislation that will protect adults who have a disability federally um, uh, to have the same right as anybody to have a heart transplant. I mean, so back in 2005, when I started writing, um, you didn't hear, I mean, from state to state, things were um, legislation was being passed, but you wouldn't hear of something federal. So that was really nice to read about recently. Um, in Hong Kong, I think the issue is that not many people are, um, I mean, I, th I think it was something like 3% in 2015. So mm. regardless of um, whether you have a disability or not, there just wasn't the supply to meet the mm. demand. Um. Your character, Marlo, is studying abroad, which is incredible in their own right. Um, I, I, I see that also following up with your own life, of, as you've described it, this, this time spent abroad and apart from family and, and the yearning that that um, inspires. Um, spending time apart from your sister and, and your family how, how does how is that um, how is that sort of inform their value to you, or 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 or, or how 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 life is different when you're together? 
Yeah, um, I think very unique to my experience, my sister, um, when she was 16 years old, contracted um, encephalitis. So she went from being this vivacious, outgoing performer to somebody who I didn't really recognize. I mean, she lost her ability to speak. She lost her ability to walk. I mean, she slowly relearned how to walk, but her speech is very limited. So being um, apart from her actually gave me some space and distance to process some of my grief, I think, mm. um, for losing the sister that I knew. Um, and and um, yeah, just gave me a, a very, um, gave me space to really um, unpick that. And I think that's kind of come through in my, in my work. And Marlo, this, this character, um, she's a budding naturalist. Um, and she's studying rare butterflies. It's, it's, uh, it's as if there wasn't enough beauty just dripping from the novel as it is. You've got this added layer to it. Um, was this something that is a, is a personal passion of yours or, or was that something that you researched specifically for the novel? Look, I write very intuitively, so I didn't set out to go... Um, write about a lepidopterist. I, ha I had a natural fascination for butterflies. Um, and I wrote a scene um, very early on, and it was one of the scenes with butterfly in it. And that kind of spurred this, it kind of opened the, the gates for me to delve into this further. So I then um, shadowed a, um, a friend of mine at the Sydney University who um, was studying entomology and so I spent hours with him in the lab and um, went to all his kind of bug groups afterwards and um, just had an amazing time learning about um, butterflies and bugs and uh, it was just endless and fascinating and just if I could come back again I'd probably <laughs> do that. Mm. What's one thing about the natural world that has inspired awe for you? Oh, so many things. Um, I mean, just some of the facts that come have come out through um, the novel, how, you know, how uh, just watching how a, a butterfly emerges from a chrysalis is just, I mean, amazing to me, or how some species sleep upside down, or, um, you know, their, their mating rituals, how it's called hilltopping, how they'll... Um, I think it's the male will, uh, no, the female will um, go high on a hill and kind of watch everything from down below and wait for her mate to or pick her mate. I mean, there's just so many wonderful, fascinating facts that, um, and not even with butterflies, just even other insects that just, um, yeah, just brought me a lot of joy while I was writing. Can you describe the hum? For our listeners, look, I I feel that something that um, is hard to pin down, um, and I don't want to, I don't want to clearly define it because I think it's different for different people. But for me, I think it's got a lot to do with the interconnectedness of all things. Um, what lies beyond love and grief and um, you know, just something that things that in life you sometimes are a bit mysterious and that you you can't always find the right word for. Mm. Um, in sometimes finding a word for it, um, I almost feel diminishes it in a way. If that makes sense. Yeah, it, it almost sounds spiritual in that sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, you everyone will just have to read this novel to. Um, witness it for themselves and feel it for themselves. Um, the kind of elation that it evokes um, and, and its connection to the natural world, it reminds me of um, Elizabeth Gilbert's signature of all things mm. and, and the big kind of discovery in, in that novel. Um, and that's a big compliment. I love that book. Um, what, what novels do you like? Oh, my favorite book that I keep revisiting is um, Grief is a Thing with Feathers by Max Porter. 
I just like, I could read that over and over. I do read it over and over again. Um, the play Angels in America is one that I love. Um, I recently read Hamnet and I really enjoyed that too. Um, I read a lot of nonfiction. Um, Insomniac City was one that I liked. Um, oh, it's, it's, I don't have one book in particular that, apart from grief is the thing with feathers, but um, that is my go-to book, but um, this is so much out there. I could just... What, what is it that you look for in, a, in an excellent book? I quite like experimental fiction. Um, I, like, I like authors that play with language. Um, Coming to Slaughter, I think it is, um, was by Ondaatje. I really loved that. Um, so I love being moved um, when I read. I, um, I love learning new things. I love um, seeing the world in a different way than I normally would. Um, yeah, it's, there's so much to love about reading. <laughs> um, everyone, and I'm guilty of this too, with relation to your book, when things are alive, they hum, uh, describe it as the perfect book club book. Um, you know, something that hits in the feels and that invites uh, conversation and remuneration, um, you know, over the roles of family and morality in the medical profession and, you know, what, what we talk about when we talk about disability, um, what's happening in China and, and how, how wildly the same but also different that is to our experience in the West. Um, there's just so much to yarn about. Um, and I think every reader will bring something new to this um, reading. What, what do you want them to walk away with? Look, I mean, if it moves them in some way, that's wonderful. Um, if, if it makes them feel something that might be difficult, that's wonderful. But if it also uplifts them, especially now during lockdown and everything we're going through, that's wonderful. Um, if somehow, I mean, they can hear the hum, that would be amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, just uh, if it provides a space for them to bring their own experiences to something that I'm trying to um, describe in the novel, then that's amazing too. And um, if I can share some of what my sister's given me, that's also amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 you have for me. <laughs> I'm sure you will with many readers. Uh, your very impressive bio um, mentions time at Afters, the Screen Academy. Do you um, envisage making this story happen on the screen somehow one day? Yeah, I mean, I actually started writing this as a screenplay while I was writing it as a novel and I had to, uh, because they're such distinct art forms, I had to put the screenplay aside to focus on the novel. Um, but of course, it was a it was a very visual process for me writing, and um, I definitely saw it in a kind of cinematic way while I was writing as well. So I mean, that would be amazing if that could happen. What are you looking forward to the most when lockdown ends? What are you gonna do next? I wanna. I just want to go like hang out with all my friends in one go and <laughs> just, just Sounds so simple. Yeah. Just eat with them and, and touch them and just be present with them. Not, not through a screen or over the phone. <laughs> I just want to okay. be around people. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we have more fiction for me. We, we write more fiction. Do you, do you love it? Yeah, I'm working on my second novel. I'm working on, I've, I've nearly finished a non-fiction um, project and I'm working on my second novel as well. Excellent. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what either of those things are about? Or? Sure. Um, I have stage for endometriosis 
And having lived in um, different countries and experienced uh, the many issues with having this disease and how I've been treated by medical professionals, the world over um, has left me with a lot to say about um, living with this disease as a woman. So that's what the nonfiction is about. And the fiction uh, novel is, it's, it's in its very um, um, beginning stages, but it's about a mother-daughter relationship. Both sound excellent. Um, this has been a real gift having you here to chat with me, even over Zoom. Um, it's, it's such a special book and it's a, there's a really, Sisterhood is, is such a special relationship that's explored in this thing. I, I think there's, there's so much to untap in this novel and I really hope readers warm to it. Um, it's, 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 a, it's also just a beautiful cover. Oh my goodness. Yeah, um, <laughs> an amazing job. I'm, I feel so lucky. So yeah, thank you. It's, um, it's, it's really nice to have that feedback. An event. Um, thank you for being on the podcast. We'll have you in person next time. Yeah, that'd be lovely. Thanks for having me. When Things Are Alive, They Hum is published by Ultimo Press. We have a limited number of autograph copies available for sale on Booktopia. Um, if you're in a lockdown city, also consider getting it from a local independent bookseller if they have one close to you. Um, you can help support local jobs and uh, central businesses. Um, that's all from us. Never stop reading. Thank you for listening to the Booktopia podcast channel. Don't forget, you can subscribe to us on SoundCloud and iTunes for free and get access to hundreds of author discussions, book analysis pieces, and more. Or, if your eyes need a workout, head to Booktopia TV on YouTube. Don't forget, for all books featured in this podcast, and for access to a whole bunch of other fun content on our blog, head to Booktopia, Australia's local bookstore, at booktopia.com.au.